seeing incidents involving strikes by the Myanmar military almost on a daily basis. In most of the cases, civilians, civilian objects and civilian infrastructure pay the price ultimately. So we have documented schools being targeted, medical facilities and re religious buildings. Isolated by international sanctions, it's Russia that is supplying Myanmar with increasingly deadly air power. Not only the support has not decreased, um, Russian representatives have made very clear that despite the coup of 2021, they will continue to provide uh, the Myanmar military with air force assets. I'm Rebecca Henschke. This is the documentary from the BBC World Service. For assignment this week with colleagues in Myanmar, I've been investigating the junta's war in the air. Driving on a windy road through mountains covered with jungle and then patches of bamboo groves and banana trees. This is the border region between Myanmar and, and Thailand and we're going to meet people who fled their village after it was bombed in February and they're now taking refuge in this area. In this region, the ethnic Karen people have been fighting the Myanmar military for decades for greater autonomy. After the coup more than two years ago, they joined forces with the democracy movement and have been providing military training and weapons to young protesters. As we weave our way through the mountains, our Kareni driver, who's a lead singer in a revolutionary band, belts out one of his protest tracks. Welcome to Kothule, welcome, Kothule, welcome. After five hours on the road, we arrive at a teak meeting hall where the displaced villagers are waiting for us. Oh, that was a long journey. <laughs> Nai Ang shows me videos on his phone of his destroyed village back in Myanmar. You can see just the shell of the church. The church was destroyed by the Burmese military. He's a teacher whose school was also damaged in the attack. I was really scared. The sound was so loud and we were terrified by the bombs. Another video is from August. In it, you see children at a different school hiding under their desks as the sound of fighter jets fills the air. Duck down, duck down, the teacher tells them. When they think it's safe, they run. Keep to the side and duck down. Quick, quick, the teacher tells them. The plane circles back. While crouching in a rubbish ditch just next to the toilet, the children start to pray. God will save you. Don't worry. You can say your prayers louder, says a resistance fighter who came to help the children. When some of the children start whimpering, he says, don't be scared. Your friends are all around you. They're safe this time. But just over a month later, a school in central Myanmar was hit. This little boy was amongst the survivors. I heard planes. Then the shooting started. The loud bangs were deafening, he tells my colleagues in Myanmar. He's just seven years old. Seven of his friends were killed. Soldiers took their bodies away and burnt them. I wake up in fear, he says. I get flashbacks of my friends who were killed. I'm scared to go back to school. I just want to learn in peace. But 
strikes are now a daily occurrence for the people of Myanmar. The deadliest attack in April, killing over 170 people. It was reportedly carried out by Russian attack helicopters and jets. Zaytu Ang used to fly them. Most of my friends keep fighting. Uh, I jinx my people. Just my uh, Myanmar people. He was a captain in the Myanmar Air Force. Becoming a fighter pilot for the junta was a dream come true. All I wanted to do since I was young was fly a plane. That's the only reason I joined, no other reason. My adopted father really wanted me to become a military officer. I come from a poor family. My family thought that I would get a good salary and be able to live a respectable life if I joined the military. So your family was very proud of you? Yes, right. When I was chosen as a cadet, not only my family, but everyone in our region was proud of me. Everyone related to me was proud of me. They praised me. But people's view of men in uniform like him dramatically changed when the military seized power in the coup. Zaytu Ang says he knew straight away that it was a mistake. They are monsters. Most of them are people seen uh, knowing all, all soldiers are monsters. But it took him over a year to defect. Although I had made up my mind, it wasn't easy to leave the military. I had to carefully plan the best way to do it. We often used to say that you only leave the army when you are dead, not alive. He also worried about how he would be viewed by his own people on both sides. How could people trust someone who betrayed the army he was in for 18 years? I was also indoctrinated for many, many years. It was very hard to betray the institution I was in for 18 years. What I feared the most was the idea of being a traitor. He was helped by an underground network run by opposition groups. They helped defectors like him escape and then cross the border into Thailand. He now lives in a compound with others who have fled. In the middle is a grove of trees. There's bamboo, banana trees, dragon fruit, and lots of ponds with fish and lotus flowers in them. In one of these houses is the captain's shop he now runs. It sells everything from washing powder to chips and lollies. Captain's wearing a crisp white shirt tucked into a Burmese longji, the male sarong. He's smoking a, a long cigar. He's a very welcoming face and a big smile and looks much younger than his 30 odd years. In the back room of his shop, Captain Ung is on a Zoom meeting. How do we distinguish fighter jets from ordinary planes at night? The voice on the other end asks. He passes on inside intelligence about the Air Force to the resistance. And how do you pass on that information and how detailed do you go? It depends on what information is needed, what people are looking for. Are they trying to protect themselves from bombings? Or are they trying to understand the types of military planes? Or do they want to know about military air bases? We share our knowledge based on that. Are you ever troubled by the fact that you're giving information to groups that are fighting against your former colleagues, your former friends? I have no hatred for people still in the military. I don't hate them at all. We are fighting against a system. If we don't attack those who are defending that system, we will not be able to achieve the federal democracy we want. So we are not attacking this person or killing that person. At a personal level, those brothers, friends, teachers whom I lived with, I have no hatred for them. The information that you are giving may lead to the killing of your former colleagues. I don't know what they are going to do with it. They requested information and I answered the best way I can. That's all.
pulls out some printed satellite images. So we're looking at uh, Google Earth pictures of Napidor Airport uh, that shows a major upgrade. Napidor Airport, the Air Force's main base, is where he used to live. He points to three large sheds. We built them, he says, to make way for the arrival of six new fighter jets from Russia, the Sukhoi 30s. To place the Sudadi, yes, a Sudadi aircraft. What did this upgrade and the arrival of the Su 30s mean for the Myanmar military? Sudadi well, It was very important because the planes are very large, so their attack radius is very wide. What was the training program? What did the Russian team on the ground teach the Myanmar Air Force? So the Myanmar Air Force got the Myanmar. The Myanmar Air Force chose 50 pilots and crew ahead of the arrival of the first two planes. There are around eight pilots, including Su-30 squadron commander and more than 40 air crew. So more than 50 people were sent to Russia to get training on how to operate these planes. So far, two have been delivered and put on show at military parades like this one. Leonie from Myanmar Witness says their arrival represents a significant upgrade. The Sukhoi 30 is an advanced multi-role fighter jet that has both air-to-air -air and air-to-ground capabilities in the version that was exported to Myanmar. It has an even greater capacity to carry weapons up to 8,000 kilograms and as of this moment represent the most advanced aircraft in the arsenal of the Myanmar military. There have long been ties between the military and Russia, but post-coup, Moscow has stepped up to become the junta's biggest foreign backer. According to the latest report from the UN Special Rapporteur for Myanmar, over $400 million worth of arms have been shipped from Russia to the military since they seized power, including from state-owned companies. It's a David and Goliath war in the air. The People's Resistance is using civilian drones, the kind you use to take video from to fight back in the air. 25-year-old Tiger Keen leads a group of female drone bombers. We don't have any resources like the military council. We rely only on public donations, so we can't afford to buy planes. But we don't dwell on this. We just think about how we can fight to win against their planes. On the ground in their jungle camp, she and other women attach homemade bombs to the bottom of the drones. Compared with a plane, our drone is like a sesame seed. However, it can go far when you have many sesame seeds. I don't feel discouraged. We are now developing more advanced techniques. We are exploring and testing weapons that can bring down their planes. Before the coup, she was a university student. In one drone video she shares with us, you see her fly above a military convoy that is travelling along a road. When it stops to refuel, Tiger Kin releases the bomb. It spirals down, and then a few seconds later, you see a small cloud of smoke and soldiers running. If we fly high, like 300 meters above, they don't even know that we are coming. So we can attack them effectively, and they are scared of drones. Drone attacks are 